good evening everyone uh, so nice to see everybody in person after almost three weeks uh, it's frustrating to uh, you know do worship to a camera you know it's not engaging and it's so nice to be able to be back uh, be nice to be able to have transport to get here uh, so thank you everyone for joining us this evening would you uh, rise as we come this time Lord would like like to welcome everyone who's joining us on the live stream as well uh, let's uh, pray and commit this time of worship and this service unto him father we thank you lord that um, lord we are able to meet in person lord those of us who are here and everyone who is watching as well father lord i know that some of us have put aside time lord and overcome many obstacles lord to be a part of this service father lord and just want to give you thanks for making a way for always being faithful lord for your people together we thank you lord that we have opportunities like this father that we can experience your holy spirit and lord we don't want to be a people lord who take it for granted so thank you lord for your faithfulness in our lives and even as we head in this time of worship father i pray that you would speak to us lord that this time of worship would be a blessing lord to each and every one of us, Lord, that we'd connect and hear from you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. See? 
church even before we sing this next chorus uh, just feel that you know in situations that we go through in what we may have been going through in the last you know covid started then it was first wave second wave third wave and then we lost count after a while and now with you know even this economic crisis it's it's so easy to get caught up in the lack it's so easy to get caught up in the things that we don't have uh, i know personally for me and for the both of us it's it's so easy to get frustrated and get into that pattern of oh you know god when is this going to come through for us when it, when is when are you going to provide that when is the next miracle or the you know need being met but we forget so often how faithful god has been even through the storms even through uh even through the darkest situations and i would just like all of us to you know close our eyes and really think of one or two things that you can really be thankful for even if it's just one thing that you know it can be something as small as oh i i was able to manage a, get managed to get a try shot to go to work this week or you know somebody a stranger looked at me and smiled at me and that made my day something that could be insignificant but even in those little things even in those small details god is there and his faithfulness is there so let's take a minute or two to really thank god for those things in our life that regardless of what we lack regardless of the situation we are in where god has still been faithful and let's really give him thanks this this evening church for for he deserves all the glory he deserves all the praise just like we sang earlier through it all he has been faithful he has carried us in his everlasting arms that we can rely on that even through the storms that you are there even in the winds blowing against us father lord you are faithful that you are never changing
Stand unshaken. Your name is higher, your word is unfailing. Yes, Jesus, for you are the faithful one. And you are the rock that we stand on, Father. A rock that will never fall. A hope that will never shake, Father. Lord, we give you thanks, Lord, for that. Yes, Father, in Jesus' name.
Isaiah 41 and verse 10, the Lord tells us, Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yes, I will help thee. Yes, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. The Lord reminds us, fear not. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for those assuring words, Lord, because you are the God who has said, fear not. You have said, lo, I'm with you always, even to the very end of the ages. And Lord, forgive us for the times, Lord, when we have had fear and doubt. And Lord, the times, Lord, we have let the situations around us, Lord, take our eyes away from you. Lord, this evening we confess, Lord, we are sorry, Lord, because you are our Father, you are our Abba Father. We can come to you at any time, Lord, because the veil of the temple was rent in two from top to bottom. That was the love of Jesus for our lives, Lord. And Lord, as we look back, Lord, it was you who have seen us through every situation, Lord. And Lord, nothing is too hard for you, Lord. And Lord, we just commit our lives to you, Lord. Lord, that we would keep trusting you day by day in every situation because you are in sovereign control of our lives. Lord, we just bring this nation of Sri Lanka before you. Lord, we cry out to you, Lord, on behalf of the people of this nation. We are the chosen few, Lord. And Lord, we just cry out to you, Lord. And Lord, we just pray for those, Lord, you have placed in authority. Lord, because you said to pray for those in authority over us so that we can live a peaceable life. And Lord, in obedience to your word, Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would give them wisdom and understanding, Lord. Lord, because they are placed here for a reason and a season for you to fulfill your plan for Sri Lanka. And Lord, we just pray, Lord, for the armed forces and the police. Lord, we pray, Lord, that there would be a spirit of restraint and wisdom, Lord. Lord, we just cry out to you, Lord, for the judiciary lord lord because you are the righteous judge and you rule over this nation lord lord we just pray lord that your wisdom will prevail over this nation and lord because you have great plans for this nation lord we just pray lord for abundance for this nation lord lord in the fields in the waterways in the seas surrounding this nation lord we just pray lord that you would open the windows of heaven and pour out abundance, Lord, upon this nation, because this nation belongs to you, and Lord, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord over Sri Lanka. And Lord, we just thank you, and we praise you, and we worship you. Lord, we also pray, Lord, for the church, Lord. Lord, that the church will stand up at this time, Lord. And Lord, that we, the church, would be a beacon of light and hope for this nation, Lord. Lord, that so that the children can continue their education, Lord, without any disruption, Lord. Lord, we just pray, Lord, that you would provide our daily needs, Lord, be it the fuel, the gas, the food. Lord, you know what our needs are. And Lord, you have promised in your word, Lord, that you would meet our needs according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And Lord, we just commit this time into your hands. Holy Spirit of the living God, stir our hearts up Lord Lord to receive from you this evening so that we will go from this place Lord saying that we have met with you and our lives have been touched and changed by you thank you Jesus thank you Lord Amen Good evening. Well, after a long break, we are back. Uh, it's good to be back. Today I'm um, starting a new series. Uh, it's the, and 
if I give it a title, it will be The Great I Am, which is basically talking about the seven I Am statements that Jesus made in the book of John. Okay, so that's what we're going to study. In the Old Testament, we studied seven um, compound names of God. Uh, we studied uh, those seven names. That, uh, by the way, people have asked me, are there only seven names? No, there are many more, but we stuck to seven names. Okay, there are more than seven. But you ask the question, why are we doing this? You know, Paul, one of the greatest apostles, one of the greatest evangelists in the Bible, at the end of his life, he has been teaching, preaching, and basically serving God with all his life. He gave his whole life after he came to salvation. He poured out his life as an offering unto the Lord. But at the end of his life, sitting in a prison cell, he has written epistle after epistle. He has basically uh, started, planted church after church. But after all this, in the end, he's writing one of his prison epistles, Philippians chapter 3 verse 10, he says, This is my heart, this is my desire, he's saying, I want to know Christ. I want to know Jesus. And you would think, well, don't you know Jesus? You're, you're preaching about him. You have written epistles that the, the doctrine of the church is founded on today, the epistles of, of, of Paul. And yet he says, this is my heart's cry, that I want to know Jesus. And I believe this is so important for us. There is never a place in our hearts or our lives, there is never a time that you and I can ever come to, to saying, you know what, I know Jesus, that's it. Because He is God. There is no limit of you and I getting to know Him. And in, in the Gospel of John, John focuses on the Godship of Jesus Christ, the divinity of Jesus, should I say. He focuses on Jesus as the Son of God. In fact, he starts his epistle in 1 John 1. The very first verse says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So he's saying the Word is God. So he talks about the Trinity when the Bible says with God, it basically means the word was face to face with God, so equal to God. And then he goes on to say, yes, but that word was face to face with God, is God. A few verses later, he says, this word, who is God, became flesh and dwelt among us. Who is that? Jesus Christ. So he starts off with this lofty statement of saying, Jesus is God. And he says, I'm going to show you that through seven miracles that he did and seven statements he made about his own life is what John does in his book and he said because you got to know him and believe upon him and it is then that you would have life that is the purpose and the crux of the book of the gospel of John and in this he comes up with seven statements Jesus made about himself and they're called the seven I am statements of Jesus See, we want to know Jesus, friends, because Daniel tells us in Daniel 11.32, those who know their God will do great exploits. The more and more you come to know about God, the more and more you're able to do in this life to bring glory to Him. Okay, so this is kind of the very focus of what we're going to do the next couple of weeks. So we are going to talk about the, the seven I am statements of, of, of uh, Jesus. So the first uh, thing that I want you to know is when Jesus says, I am, he says, I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection and the life. He goes on, I am the door. I am the, you know, the good shepherd. He, he talks about these seven statements that he makes. But it's interesting to know that when he says, I am, in the Greek, it's a very specific word that is used for I am. And that word is ego emi. Ego emi. Okay? E G O, ego emi. E I M I. E I M I. Ego emi. Okay? And what it means is, ego means I. Okay? I. And emi means I am. 
So ego in, in me basically means I am, I am. So when Jesus says it in the Greek, he was speaking Aramaic at the time probably, even Greek. Okay, so Jesus used both languages when he preached and he spoke. So what Jesus is saying, I am, I am the resurrection and the life. Okay, now this is very interesting because when you go to the Old Testament, now the Old Testament was written in Greek, uh, it's called the Septuagint, okay? It was written in Greek, and if you go to the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 3 verse 14, when God was speaking to Moses, and Moses comes to God and says, God, God says, go to my people and say that I'm here to deliver them. And Moses says, yeah, that's fine, God, but who do I say sent me? And what does God say? Say, I am who I am sent me. And the word in Greek, I am who I am, is the same word that Jesus uses in the New Testament. Ego, eme. Now in the Hebrew, it's ehye. Okay? And that's where we get the word Yahweh from. Okay? It's the covenant name of God. So Jesus is not just saying, I am the bread of life, by just saying, you know what, I want you guys to know that I am the bread of life. He's saying, I am God. I am Yahweh, the bread of life. So these are divine statements he's making about his own divinity. So he says, I am, and in fact, the seven compound names of God read the same way in the Hebrew. It is Yahweh Jireh, Yahweh Rohi, Yahweh Rapha, which is basically, I am your provider. I am your healer. I am, or Yahweh is your healer, or I am is your healer. And it's the same thing that Jesus is using in the New Testament. So if anyone tells you Jesus never claimed to be God, they have not read the Bible. Okay? Because Jesus clearly stated who he was. He clearly showed them that he was not just God, he was Yahweh. God. Okay? And that's the seven statements of Jesus, which you will learn in time to come. I'm not going to go through them all, but today we are going to speak about one of them. And the first one we find in the book of John is found in John chapter 6, verse 24 to 35, I think it is. Yes, 24 to 35. And let's read that passage because it's important. So if you turn your Bible, if you don't have your Bibles, go over here. Okay. John chapter 6 verse 24 to 30 says, When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate manna in the desert, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then he said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. I am the bread of life. Jesus uses bread as a metaphor. Now, I don't know about you, but I like bread. I just love bread. You go to a restaurant, I love when they bring the bread rolls. Haven't you eaten the bread rolls, hot bread rolls, especially if you're in Noorelia? 
bread rolls, hot bread rolls with butter. Oh, it's awesome. The Bible, bread is used a lot in the Bible. Okay? Uh, it's used as a metaphor and it's also used in bread was the staple of the Jewish diet. Okay? Now, as a metaphor uh, and as, as bread, as the actual thing, bread comes is, uh, about 490 times in the Bible it talks about bread. So that's a lot. Okay, that's a lot. And therefore there's something about bread. In fact, in the Old Testament, in the tabernacle, there was a very special table for bread. It was called the table of show bread. There were 12 loaves or cakes of bread on that table. Okay? And um, it, it represented fellowship. It represented the people of God. But looking forward, it represented Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Well, when the 12 tribes of Israel were about to enter into the promised land and they sent out spies and, and 10 spies brought a negative report. In Numbers 14 uh, verse 9, Joshua and Caleb come and tell the people, listen, the victory is ours, the land is ours, the defense of the enemies have gone down, and this is our bread, they say. In other words, the, the victory and the, and the claiming of the promised land was their bread. Bread. It was what they were meant to receive. Okay. Now, Jesus in the New Testament, when he was tempted, he said, Man does not live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth, mouth of God. Uh, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. By the, word, uh, by the way, Beth means house, and Lehem means bread. So, Bethlehem is the house of bread. Okay. And that's where Jesus was born. The bread of life came out of the house of bread, by the way. In communion, the elements, we have the bread and the wine. Okay? Um, we know that when Jesus taught us to pray, what did he say to pray? He said, give us this day our daily bread. Because bread kind of encompassed everything that you and I need for our physical lives. When Jesus was healing... People in Syrophoenicia and the Syrophoenician woman came and in Syria actually and the Syrophoenician woman comes to Jesus and speaks to him and says heal my daughter what did Jesus say do I give the bread of the children to the dogs what he meant was the bread is what is ours it's ours it's our, our birthright in a sense and that's what even Joshua and Caleb meant when they said this is our bread it means that victory is our birthright okay so, you see this a lot in the Bible. In fact, as I said, Israel, in their diet, bread was the staple. It was the main thing. Now, the poor people made bread out of barley, and the rich made bread out of wheat. But it was bread. Right? And what happens is, uh, they would have vegetables, they would have fruit, olives, and cheese. That's, that, that's kind of their staple. Uh, for protein, they would have fish. Okay, lamb was very exclusive. It was for very special occasions, and sometimes for ce celebrations or Passovers. Okay, but bread was the staple of their diet. So when Jesus says, "I am the bread of life," he's saying, "I as much as bread is essential." For your physical life, I am essential for all of your life. And that's what he's saying. In fact, the, the rabbis used to call bread the bread of life because bread was so important in their diet. Okay. So Jesus says, I am the bread of life. It's in this context. Now, let's look at the, the biblical context of this or, or the, the, the storyline. How did it lead up to Jesus saying, I'm the bread of life? He didn't just wake up one morning, go to the people and say, listen, I'm the bread of life. Where did it come from? How did he build up to this? And the context is found in John chapter 6. Now in John chapter 6, uh, uh, the, the passage that we read says, When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. So they were kind of this hide-and-seek game was going on. They were looking for Jesus. They were hunting for Jesus. 
Okay? And Jesus was kind of trying to avoid them, right? For a very specific reason that we learn is that these people wanted to make, take Jesus by force and make him a king. And Jesus was like, that's not what I'm here for. So I don't want this. So Jesus was trying to avoid the crowd, but they kept looking for him all over the place. And they finally found him in John 6, 24. But why did they want to make him a king? And for that, you've got to go back to the beginning of the chapter. In the beginning of the chapter, we have the most famous story in the Bible. A miracle that is recorded in all four Gospels. The feeding of the 5,000. Now, in the feeding of the 5,000, in John chapter 6, verse 10, it says, So the men sat down in number about 5,000. It says, men alone were 5,000. So if you add the women and the children, you're looking at about 15 to 20,000 people at least who Jesus had to feed that day. Okay? By the way, we are the only ones who call it, I mean, we, we call it the feeding of the 5,000, but back then when the Bible was written, they didn't put a title to it. Okay? So they're just saying men were 5,000, but there was actually, there would have been about 15 to 20,000 people. And Jesus sees these people, this crowd, and he has so much compassion on them that even though he's tired and weary, we know that he just got news that his cousin John was beheaded. He and, uh, you know, the disciples had been on a ministry trip throughout Israel and they just wanted some R&R. &R. But the crowd was coming. And when they saw the crowd, Jesus had so much compassion on them that he forgot his tiredness. He forgot his sadness, his sorrow. And he ministered to these people. That's the heart of Jesus, friends. You know, sometimes you and I got to think, we look at our own problems and we can't see anything beyond that. But if you want, as a disciple of Jesus, there are times you have to give out, you know, Put your tiredness and your sorrow and your struggles on the back burner so that you can minister to people who are suffering. And that's what Jesus did. Now, I'm not saying that's something you do all the time. You have to minister that as well. Others, you're going to burn out. But there's times for that as well. Now, Jesus is ministering to these people and it gets very late. So in the Gospel of John, he turns to Philip and the Bible says in verse 5 and 6, he turns to Philip and says, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? He says, You've got to feed these people. So Philip, where are you going to get bread from? And the Bible goes on to say, But he said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Jesus was testing Philip. And the question is why? Why was Jesus testing Philip? He was not f testing him to fail him. He was testing him to draw out faith. Because Philip and all these disciples with him had seen miracle after miracle after miracle that Jesus did. They had been maybe a year with Jesus by this point hearing him preach and teach to them about who he was and what he came to do. So, Jesus is saying, are you ready to put your faith in me for a miracle? That's what he was asking Philip. He was trying to draw out faith. And sometimes Jesus puts us in situations not to crush us down, but he puts us in those situations to draw out faith. Philip had an opportunity to put his trust and demonstrate faith in Jesus Christ. But sadly, he failed. Instead of putting his faith in Jesus, he looked at all the negative things that were there. All the negative things. In fact, Philip's answer to Jesus was 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. He's saying, Jesus, six to seven months, because the denarii was about one, month, uh, one day's wage, 
So 200 denarii was about six to seven months salary. So count your salary, okay, and see six months, multiply it by six, and say that amount of money was not enough to feed these people, is what Philip is saying. In other words, he's saying, Lord, we don't have the money for this. Now, in another gospel, the disciples come to Jesus and says, this is a deserted place, a deserted place. The hour is already late, send the multitudes away. In other words, they're saying, listen, Jesus, it's too late. There are no shops open at this time. And by the way, it was the Passover time. So there was no shops open at that time. They said, in fact, even if there are shops open, where we are right now, there aren't any shops. This is out in the wilderness almost. This is out in a place where there are no places to buy bread. It's too late. The shops are closed. We don't have enough money. This is what they are speaking. They're looking at all the negative, everything that is against us. And says, Lord, it is impossible. Now Jesus had been teaching them for a long time. And he's trying to tell them, listen, are you ready to put your trust in me at least now? And church, I just want to challenge you right now. I believe that's what Jesus is asking us today. Right now. Are you willing to trust me? And I know some of us are thinking, yeah, but there's not, no fuel. We have only for another 22 days of petrol. You know, gas, okay, we have stuff, but for how long? You know, electricity cuts, money problems. There's no foreign reserves. You know, all these issues, you know, the political mayhem. And the Lord is saying, yeah, all that's there. Don't state the obvious. Because Philip was stating the obvious. Anyone can state what we don't have. Anyone can tell us the problem. But Jesus is saying, listen, if you are my disciples, don't, I don't want to know what the problem is because everyone knows the problem. You don't have to be a believer, someone with faith, to state the problem. He's saying, I want to know where are you going to find bread? And they are stating the, the obvious here. And you know what the Bible says? He tested them because he already knew what he was going to do. And today, this is what the Lord wants you to hear, uh, friends. Jesus knows what he is going to do for you already. He knows problems that you don't even know about. He already has the solution for it. He has the solution, friends. And this was what he was trying to draw out of Philip. He was saying, where is your source of bread? Where is your resource? Where is your source? Philip is looking at his money, his bank balance, because that was his source. Philip was looking at the shops. And Jesus says, I'm standing right here. And you're not looking at me. Today, we can all talk about what the problem is. But who is your source? Because if it is Jesus, friends, he already knows what he's going to do. You say, well, I don't know. That's okay. He knows. You don't have to know. God knows. He has a solution. He has a plan for Sri Lanka. He has a, not just a plan, he has a solution for this nation. And he knows what he's going to do. And I know some, of, some people are, you know, very upset with what's happening. Not some people, everybody probably is. And you know, you're saying this shouldn't have happened, and that shouldn't have happened, and this is happening, and that is happening. And I tell you what, everybody knows the problem. But Jesus is saying this, I know the solution. And this is what I'm going to do.
We need to have faith. And this is why its faith is so important. Hebrews says you can't please God if you don't have faith. Your life is not pleasing to God if you are living a life of skepticism and doubt and unbelief. And calling yourself a Christian. All he wants from us, friends, is to trust him. You know, that is one of the easiest things he's calling us to do. We complicate it. We complicate it. Philip complicated it that day. Because all he had to say is, Jesus, well, I don't know, but you are my resource. You are the source. You are the one who has been doing all the miracles. You are the one who's been healing the sick. You are the one who turned water into wine. You are the one who has done all these miracles. You are the one who calmed the storms in the sea. Lord, you have the answer and I'm coming to you. That's all Philip had to do. Instead of complicating it by telling Jesus all the negative, all the problem. See, when you dwell on your problem, you're not going to have faith. Because faith comes not by dwelling on your problems. Faith comes by hearing and hearing what? The word of God. So today, if you want to be victorious in the situations you're going through today, stop spending all that time on your WhatsApp groups and, and your Facebook and all that. Because what you're doing is you're generating fear. If you want faith, and if you want to be a man or a woman of faith, who does the impossible, then take the word of God and day and night meditate upon his word. That's the way you overcome church. Because he's not asking us to do much, honestly. He's not asking you to walk on water. Jesus never asked anyone to walk on water. He did it, but he never asked you. He's not asking you to climb up on a cross and crucify yourself and die the death that he died. He's not asking, though he says, take up your cross. That's more figurative than actually jumping up on a cross and getting nails in your hand. He's not asking you to do great miracles. He's asking you to trust him. He does the miracles. That's why I can't understand when people look at to a person and say, Oh, that's, that guy does great miracles. You know the difference? He just is putting his trust in Jesus. That's the difference. Where we go to Jesus and we're like, Oh, will this happen? Well, this problem is too big. We don't have money. It's too late. The shops are closed. By the time you talk yourself out of faith, And this is what's happening. He says, where will you get bread? Where is your source for provision? Who is your source? What happens tomorrow if you lose your job? What happens if the country comes to a situation where you can't work anymore? Then what? Are you going to starve and die? Well, if your job was your source, you might. But if Jesus is your source, He's the God who says, I look after birds in the air. And those birds are pretty dumb, friends. I have seen birds flying into glass and just knocking themselves out. I've seen that happening. And, and, and I tell you what, Jesus says, I look after those guys. He says, I look after the lilies in the field. I array them even better than Solomon did. Was dressed up in all his gold and silver. How much more valuable and precious are you to me? Who is your source? Is what Jesus is asking us this evening. Are you willing to trust me? Sadly that day he couldn't find a single person who put their trust in him. So he did the miracle himself. Well, Andrew brings a boy with, you know, five barley loaves and a few fishes, obviously coming from a very poor family, right? This little boy. I, I always like to think, when his mother packed his lunch that morning, what was going on in her mind? <clears throat> I know my wife gets up early morning and packs a lunch for her son. I wonder whether he feeds 5,000 with it or not. I don't know, but... 
that boy that day when she packed that lunch did she know that that act is going to go down in history and that goes for some of you I'm saying this because there's somebody here who thinks listen what I'm doing is so little and so small and insignificant okay all this great talk about faith and doing great things is great but not me and the Lord is telling you this evening did I say morning yeah I think I did okay this evening that I can take those little things and do great things with it and that's what Jesus did he took the five loaves and the fish. even that Andrew comes to him and says we have only this you know how much is this going to feed that's that's his attitude and Jesus takes it and he thanks the father and he distributes it and 5,000 people ate the Bible says they ate so much they ate to their fill and they ate as much as they wanted is what the Bible says and even after they ate in fact the King James Version says they, they, they ate like the gluttons almost the word that is used there and they ate so much and yet there were 12 baskets full of food what is Jesus saying what he was saying to the disciples is I am more than enough for you what he's saying to us 2,000 years later is the same thing today you may feel like you're on that mountainside the shops are closing it's getting late there is no money in the bank there is no way that you can get what you need right now and the Lord is saying the same thing to you friends I am more than enough isn't he, he awesome isn't he awesome well Jesus perceived that the crowd was getting ready to make him king and he ran off into a mountain and he sent his disciples he kind of did you know when someone is pursuing you you split up he sent his disciples across the lake he ran up to the mountain and the crowd got fooled they were kind of like that bird they didn't know where he was they were like where is Jesus which one is Jesus and they couldn't follow in fact the Bible says they got into boats and they were following can you imagine this would have been so hilarious honestly all these guys in boats let's get Jesus and we make him king and Jesus is running off into the mountains but as the boat was crossing the lake there was a, a storm a huge storm right so they were going to Capernaum and there was a huge storm on the way so the boat was about three to four miles in the lake and there was a massive storm and the disciple Jesus sees this he's up on the mountain and he sees them and one of the gospels says they were straining and they were straining once again why did he do that don't you think he knew there was a storm coming out in the sea of course he knew that so why did he send the disciples off in the boat and you're like yeah right Jesus you waited up on the hill because there was a storm you sent us out on the sea to get into trouble is that what Jesus was doing no he was trying to draw out faith and then I just want to remind you something Jesus was in the flesh right so seemingly limited he was not kind of omnipresent at that time because he was not everywhere all the time so he was limited at the same time the Bible tells us exactly that the boat was about three to four miles in the sea of Galilee okay so from the shore three to four miles there was this barrier of water he is up on a mountain but when he sees his disciples struggling he walks on water to get to them in other words friends no flesh no limitations no mountain no sea no distance can stop Jesus from getting to you that's the Jesus we have he will go through whatever barrier there is to get to you and why am I saying this again because there's someone who's either watching this or someone who's here who's saying in your heart I am so distant from God right now and you feel that God is not hearing your prayers you feel God is not seeing your tears you feel that God is far away from you right now and the Lord wants you to know this 
that there is no barrier, no distance, no height, no depth, no angel, no demon, no life, no death that can separate him from you. And this is what Paul wrote in Romans 8, 35 to 9, 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written for your sake? We are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for slaughter. Yet in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now listen to this. For I am persuaded. I know. I believe. I trust. I know for sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is a word for you. And you know what? The disciples were terrified. But he walks on water. He gets into the boat. And he tells them this. When they were terrified, he tells them this. It is I. Do not fear. You know, it's interesting, the word, when he says, it is I. Guess what word he uses in Greek? Ego. Eme. He says, I am. I am. Do not fear. In other words, he's telling them, listen, I'm not just your friend, your buddy, just this good guy who did miracle worker. He's not saying that. He's saying, I am God. I've got you. Do not fear. Friends, this is what he's telling us this evening. Ego in me. I am who I am. I am Emmanuel, God with you. Do not fear. I've got you. I'm not just a good person. I'm not just a miracle worker. I'm not just this person who came 2,000 years ago in the flesh and died for your sins and shed his blood for you. I am, I am, I am Yahweh the self-existent one who is with you, who's got you, who nothing in all the world, not in, in heaven or hell or underneath the earth or anywhere, nothing can separate that me from you. And I have got you. Wow. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? And the moment Jesus climbed into the boat, the storm seized. And immediately the boat, which was now three to four miles off the shore on the way to Capernaum. So from there to Capernaum would have been about eight miles, five to eight miles. Okay? Because it depends whether they were going diagonally or straight across, right? Because it's 13 miles and eight miles. So they were kind of in the middle. So it was about eight miles, five to eight miles to their destination. Five to eight miles and as soon as he got in... They were there. They were at the destination. Immediately. And this is what he can do for you. He didn't have to take the long route. They were in the middle of the sea one minute. The next minute they are on shore. And the people understood this. The disciples understood this. But why is he doing this friends? Because he wants to draw faith. He wants them to believe. Jesus died so that you can believe in him. That's what he asks from us. The Bible says God sent, God so loved the world that he sent his son. Anyone who believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This is what he wants from us. To believe. And all this crisis is going on around us. The one thing he's asking the church is, will you believe? We say, well, he's asking us to pray. Yes, with faith. Or he's asking us to help the poor. Yes, by trusting him. 
He's asking us to give the gospel with faith and trusting and believing in Him. Because without it, everything we do means nothing. Well, finally the people catch up to Him. And I like their question. They say, Rabbi, we were looking for you. Where were you? Weren't you on the other side of the mountain? How come you ended up over here? So they knew the miracle that had happened. So Jesus answered and said to them, and you know, Jesus goes straight to the question. He doesn't like to go round and round and round in circles. You know, some people, they like to go in circles and circles. You talk to them and they're just going round and round and not getting to the point. Jesus is a person who went straight to the point. And he gets to the point. Most assuredly, I say to you, you did not seek me because you saw the sign, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Wow, what a comeback. These guys are like, we are looking for you. Yeah, but you're looking for me, not because you saw the miracles, you're not because you saw the sign, because you ate and your stomachs were filled, you want more bread. See, Jesus immediately exposes the motives of their heart. What he's saying is, you're not here for me. You're here for the benefits that you can get from me. You're not here to seek my face. You're here to seek my hand. You're not looking for a relationship with me. You're looking for blessings. And he says, friends, listen. As long as that's what you do, you will never be fulfilled in life. You can have all the bread, but you're, you will always be hungry. You can have all the healing, but you're going to get sick again. No, the, all the blessings, material, physical blessings of Jesus is not enough to satisfy you, friends. And this is what he's trying to teach these people. You need me, is what he's saying. In other words, he's saying you're seeking to fill a physical hunger. But there's a greater hunger in each of your hearts that you are not perceiving. And it's the hunger of the human heart. And he says, you are missing this. By the way, these guys had their bellies fed up to here. They were full, completely full. Remember the Bible says they were filled and they ate as much as they wanted less than 12 hours ago. And they're back again asking for more food. What Jesus is, and that proves his point that he's making here. Okay? That you can't, no matter how much you eat, if you don't understand the true, so, uh, the, the, the true root of your hunger is a, is a heart hunger, a soul hunger. And that's why Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. You can eat all the physical bread, but unless you partake of me, you will always be hungry, you'll always be thirsty. But Jesus is saying, just as you think bread is your staple, it's the main thing, it's essential, it's indispensable in your diet. Jesus is saying, I am the staple, the main thing, the essential, the indispensable need of your heart and your soul right now. They thought they had empty stomachs. But Jesus was saying, you have emptiness of soul. And then he goes on to say in verse 27, Do not labor for food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. He says everlasting life, food for everlasting life. Now the word life in the Greek, there are two words for life in Greek. Two main words at least. Okay, the first one is bios. And that's where we get the word biology from. Okay, and it's talking about physical material life by us okay and the second one is zoe now zoe is basically the fulfilled life the transcendent life the life that is produced by god and sustained by god it's a spiritual eternal life it's fullness of life it's vitality of life it's the life that jesus said he came to give us when he said i am the, i'm the way the truth and the life that's the word zoe when he says the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I have come to give you life 
and life more abundant, it is this life he's talking about. So what Jesus is saying is, the food that endures to everlasting life, he's saying, he's talking about this vitality of life, this abundance of life, this spiritual, eternal, transcendent life, is what he's giving. And he's saying, the problem with y'all is, not y'all, but he's talking to the people. And he said, the problem with the people back then is, they didn't understand this. They thought as long as they get their stomachs filled, they're going to be okay. It's kind of like me yesterday. I thought as long as I get my petrol tank filled, I'm okay. But then after a week goes by, two weeks, you want to get your petrol tank filled again, right? I remember a couple of weeks, several weeks ago, I got a full tank of petrol and I was like, yeah, come on, I got petrol, full tank. And then about two days ago, I was like, oh no, I have nothing left. And this is what the people are. And Jesus is saying, your essential problem, you cannot solve with bios solutions. With physical, material, carnal solutions, you cannot solve your Zoe problems. Because at the heart of it, one of the sole issue is love, acceptance, security, and identity. And you cannot solve those by more food, more money, more whatever else that you want. It's only Jesus that we need. And the more we try to fill with bread, what Jesus is saying that perishes, you're always going to end up empty. And you see, when people try to do this, when they try to form, solve a, a Zoe life issue with a bio solution, they end up in despair, deeper and deeper despair, disillusionment, and discouragement. And let me tell you something today. If you are discouraged, disillusioned, or in despair, it's because you are looking at your bias issues. And you think that's the main problem. And Jesus is telling you, listen, will you trust me? Because that is your key issue here. Your key issue is trusting Jesus. You know, why do you think politicians are never satisfied with the power they have? Why do you think they want more and more and more power? Never satisfied. Why do you think people who have money are never satisfied with the money they have? Why do you think people who have fame are never satisfied with the fame they have or positions or whatever? Why do you think these people are, are like this? Because no amount of fame, no amount of money, no amount of power, no amount of every worldly thing, carnal thing, can ever satisfy you. And that's why often you see people who at the pinnacle of it all are the ones in despair, disillusionment, and very despondent.
Why? Because they were looking for solutions in the wrong place. It's a vicious cycle, friends. The more you run after that, the more you want of it. And the more you get, the more you're felt empty and useless. And what's the point of this? And you say, well, give me a biblical example. Solomon. He says, I had everything. I didn't stop my heart from grabbing everything I could grab. Money, wealth, power, women, whatever he wanted, he grabbed. But at the end of it, what does he say? It's useless. Meaningless. Is what he's saying. Friends, in the end, Jesus is saying, I am the only one who can satisfy you. The deepest need of your heart. I am the bread of life. You know, Blaise Pascal, the 17th century mathematician and philosopher said this, There is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every person that only God can fill. And Jesus says, and that's why Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who eats of me will never be hungry. And he who drinks will never be thirsty. Closing, I just want to give an example from the Bible. Is the Samaritan woman. She's the absolute example of this. Here was this woman who had a great Zoe need in her heart. And she thought the problem was she was not loved. In fact, if you look at, if you would ask the cry of her heart, it would be this. Can someone love me? That was the cry of her heart. So she went from one man to another, to another, to another, to another. Looking for one person in all this earth who would love her. And she couldn't find that one person. So she had come to a point, she had given up hope of this. So now she's not going to get married, she's just going to live. Okay, so she's trying to fulfill this God-shaped vacuum in her heart. And then Jesus comes along and says, I can give you water that if you drink of it, you will never thirst again. You know, someone said this, uh, Graham Greene said this, a man knocking on the door of a brothel is knocking for God. Now, when I first heard that, I was like, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. But this is what he's saying. Why do people do the things they do? Why did the Samaritan woman go after one man after another and another? Why do people take drugs till they just destroy their families and everything around them? Because they're trying to fill a Zoe need with a bio solution. Everybody knows they have a need, friends. The problem is most people don't know how to fill it. A couple of days ago, Aaron was at the Arpico in, you know, uh, and while he was there, he saw this guy who looked very visibly like a, like a, I mean, he looked a guy who was no, up to no good. But he felt he wanted to give him some money, so he went up to give him some money because he was begging there. And everybody, including the security guard there, called him to a side and said, please don't give him money. This guy's a drug addict, right? And uh, he's doing this, he's a useless fellow, you shouldn't give him anything. Uh, he's a you know, good for nothing kind of thing. And everyone there was staying there. So as he was about to walk away, the Lord impressed in his heart, I want you to go and pray for him. So he went up to this guy, and without giving him money, he said, can I pray for you? Now usually people who want money would turn around and say, no, I'd prefer the money than your prayer. And I've had that happen several times. People have told me, no, it's okay. You pray sometime later. <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> I don't want your prayer. I want money. But this guy said, yes, I want prayer. So Aaron put his hands around him and kind of embraced him and prayed for him. And he began to weep. And he said, why did you do that? He said, why do you do that? No one has done that. And he says, is this God? And he was able to pray for him, and he was able to tell him about Jesus. 
Friends, that guy became a drug addict not because he was born that way. He was looking to fulfill a Zoe need with a bio solution. That's the problem. So they come to Jesus and say, Lord, how do we do this? How do we work the works of God? And Jesus says very simply, this is how you work the works of God, friends. Believe in the one he sent. Trust him. Put your faith in him. This is all he's asking of us. So this evening as we close, I want you to look at your own life right now and ask the question, am I trying to fulfill a need? Am I trying to fulfill something with material things that I'm finding no satisfaction, despair? Am I getting discouraged? Am I being despondent? The Lord was saying is, listen, I am the solution to all this, this evening. Come to me. Trust me. I am your source. Let's pray. And then soon after that, I would want uh, Jonathan and Lulu to come up. They're going to pray. I know uh, Jean prayed for the nation, but we'll continue to pray as we close. Uh, Father, we just come before your throne of grace. Lord, and we just pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Lord, be with us. Lord, I pray that the word that we heard today, Lord, will go deep into our hearts and souls, Lord. For, Father, it is very simple, but we complicate things. Lord, like Philip, we complicate things. Lord, we try to tell you what we don't have. We try to tell you what we can't do. We try to tell you about how bad the situation is. And, Lord, all along, you know what you are going to do. You have the solution. You have the answer to the deepest needs of our heart right now. Lord, you have the answer to the one who's, who's watching this, who doesn't feel loved, who doesn't feel that anyone loves them, who doesn't feel they have anyone in their lives and they feel lonely, even in a crowd. today the Lord you will open our eyes to see that what we need is more of you because you are the solution you are the one who brings satisfaction you are the one who died for us on the cross so that you can deal with sin Lord the sin that empties our heart and and creates this vacuum in our souls Lord you are the one who dealt with sin so that Lord you can fill our hearts with your love your presence your and give us identity, acceptance, security, and love. In Jesus' name I pray, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. If you can ask Lulu to come up and, and pray, and then we're going to have Jonathan come up after that. Loving Father, Lord, you are the great I am, and in you we are fulfilled. We are secure, Lord, and we just bring this nation before you. This is your nation. This is, these are your people, Lord. And as Pastor Romer said, Father, there is a need in the hearts of our people for life, for transformative life, Lord, that it's not um, just material things that they need, Lord. They need you from the topmost person to the, the lowliest person in this nation. They need you, Father. So, Lord, we just bring our nation to you, Father. We bring every soul, every person into your hands, Lord. In each and every person is your DNA, Father. And your love, your goodness is planted in each of them. And, Lord, I pray that you would bring forth those seeds, Lord, and you would bring forth the fruit of, your, of you in every person in this nation, Father. As these hard times brings pressure, Lord, I pray that diamonds will be formed, 
father that we will as you as we are tested father that we will turn to you we will ask you and seek you father and even the person that does not know you in this country father that they would turn to you they would seek you because even if that means they have nothing else they would turn to you father lord i pray a blessing over this nation of yours father i pray that from the crops from the seas from the minds of people lord that you will bring abundance and of provision father that this nation in every part of its growth will praise you that your hand will be seen in every part of this nation father from this day forth lord as your hand as you know and you have already said lord let those things come into fruition father and lord let the people of this nation know you let them know your hand father i thank you lord for what you are doing even though it is painful even though it is hard for us lord i know you are in here i know that I know that you are God. I know Lord that through this you will bring us out and you will bring this nation Lord. So even though Lord right now it is hard, we trust you Father. We trust you and we believe in you Lord for your miracle. Lord and we turn to you as your church. Lord I pray that you use us, you use our hands and feet Lord, you use our hearts to be the light in this nation Lord. for people who can't see lord that we will be that light we would be that guide to you father that in difficult times we will we will not turn away um a person that needs you lord that we would find the grace you would find the strength lord to to um be you in this nation father lord i pray for our hearts lord at this time lord as things just keep getting hard and harder that we would not harden our hearts we would not forget who you are father but we will remember that you are the great i am that you are the god from that was there yesterday today and forever lord and that your words are will remain lord be even before the um world was formed you were there and you will be there and so lord nothing that happens can shake that lord and i pray that you would remind us of that and give us the strength give us the boldness to step forward and be you in this nation father lord help us to pray for our leaders for the situation give us your heart lord not our issues our prejudices our hurt lord but your words your voice lord open our hearts open our eyes to see you and to pray you into situations father i thank you lord again that we can come and we can pray to you because you are the great i am lord in jesus mighty name we pray amen lord thank you lord for this day father and thank you for bringing us all here god um lord i thank you lord for the message lord that we heard father and i pray lord for everyone here today Lord that you would touch everyone through that message God and that we would remember God no matter how rough and how uncertain the times may seem oh father that we would trust in you God and that we would know that you are with us you are beside us oh God no matter what the situation is oh father and even though that we would uh, feel alone God that we would always know God like Shadrach Meshach and Abednego father that you are always with us through the fire father through the uncertain times oh God and that we place our trust in you father and that our faith is you and you alone oh god and lord i pray father that you would satisfy our souls father lord that we would uh, place our lord that you would be the living water father and that our cup runs over father that you and you alone would satisfy us oh father that nothing else would do god that we would come to the place lord that our hearts are filled with you father and lord that we nothing lord nothing in this world would matter father but you father that our eyes would be fixed on you father lord not what you can give us father not the miracles father but lord just your heart oh father and that we would be drawn closer to you father and not your works oh father in the name of jesus i pray amen uh, have a awesome week and it that i said if there is anyone who wants prayer that you come up